you clicked on this video, why won't you just like it? Just take one second, like and subscribe, and you're helping us all out. There's going to be so much more content than just these interviews. We have a whole other plan. Just like and subscribe. That's all I'm asking. It's not how you put your underwear on, don't you? Just do that. It's like getting to the basket and not putting it through. Yeah. Take the fucking layup. Just hit the shot. Like the butt. Free That's two it. points. That's it. Like and subscribe. All right. We now want to welcome on a very special guest. He is a college basketball analyst for Fox Sports and CBS and Turner and the former head coach for UCLA and St. John's. It is Coach Steve Lavin. Coach, first off, thanks for joining us. And I have to say, before we started this interview, we saw your shot and it was just crystal clear, blue skies, sunny, not one inch of any weather issues whatsoever. Why did you have to rub that into us? <laughs> well, if we had taped this or did this yesterday, then uh, you would have seen uh, overcast and even some showers and uh, that cleared the skies, which is a beautiful thing in Southern California. So now you can see out to the mountains, even some of the snow-capped mountains uh, to the east of where we are. But I didn't intend to rub it in, uh, but it is it is perfect weather conditions today. Yeah, it's only 30 degrees here. Don't worry. It's fine. <laughs> we got sun today, though. Yeah, Glass half so full. It's refreshing. Yeah, It's refreshing to have it, right? Yeah. You yeah. get to experience all the seasons, as they say. Right. So off of that, um, you coach, as we mentioned, UCLA, St. John's, East Coast, West Coast. Which lifestyle do you prefer? Because you have – the high speed here in Manhattan and you have Los Angeles with the perfect weather 99% of the time, uh, excluding basketball, what would you prefer? Well, I grew up in San Francisco. So from a sentimental standpoint, that's still home. And I love the combination of culture yet nature, the beauty of Northern California. Uh, so that would have to be number one. And then for different reasons, um, LA and New York are both, places that I really enjoy. Uh, the weather, obviously, as we already touched on, of Southern California year-round is tough to beat, the beaches. Uh, but I love the energy, that palpable energy of New York City. And uh, if the opportunity presents to come back to New York at some point, I'd do it in a heartbeat if it was a good fit, uh, regardless of, you know, whether it was in broadcasting or coaching, because uh, I do miss New York, in particular downtown. I love the village. I love Tribeca. I love Soho. Uh, but I also miss Central Park. So uh, there are a lot of aspects. But if you have to boil it down, it's the energy that's uh, incomparable in terms of New York City. I mean, L.A. is not that bad either, though, right? <laughs> um, the Actually, the interesting thing I had right off of Jake, and you talked about New York is, you know, a lot of buzz, a lot of celebrities. But you were really successful out at UCLA, the 90s. You're a young guy. W did you have any kind of celebrity interactions, whether – it's like at a club or a restaurant, or did you have people coming up be like, I could be an assistant on your coach? Like, what's a crazy celebrity story out in L.A.? Because you were right in the middle of all of it. Yeah, there were a number. Number one would have to be uh, Jack Nicholson at Laker games, um, you know, post-game hanging out. He was a big basketball fan. He followed our 1995 national championship team very closely. Uh, I was an assistant at that point. Jim Herrick was the head coach. And uh, his agent, Sandy Bressler, uh, was a big UCLA advocate, donor, supporter. And so they were along for the ride in 95. And then because of that, uh, when I'd run into Jack Nicholson at uh, different events, but mostly Laker games, uh, that was always a joy. Andy Garcia, uh, as well, uh, was someone, I think, a bowling, Kobe Bryant celebrity bowling uh, tournament uh, where we were on the same team. And I got to know him well. And, uh, the Penguin, uh, Ron Say, a lot of the Dodgers, um, you know, just a fun time. It was 12 years in Westwood. Um, Hugh Hefner's children uh, came to our camps um, and Everybody. so had the opportunity <laughs> to get to know Hef and uh, his wife and, and his children. So uh, just an interesting experience being in L.A. for those 12 years and, and of course, associated with the basketball program, Coach Wooden. And uh, just a host of great players and good people, gifted athletes. And UCLA is world-class university, so you also run into Nobel Prize winners and Pulitzer Prize winners and people on the faculty that are trying to come up with research. Just a, just a really interesting place. Yeah, and UCLA, when you coach there, one of my I, – I don't know why, but I love Matt Barnes. 
and you coach Matt Barnes. How is he? How is he coaching him? Because he's wild to me, and I think he's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so happy uh, for Matt. Just in terms of you know his work in television and uh, his podcast, and uh, yeah, his podcast course, is unbelievable. Yeah, partnered with Stephen Jackson, All the Smoke, and uh, the HBO, you know, relationship that he has, and doing really creative things uh, in terms of content, and whatnot. Not surprised. Uh, he's very bright and a fresh and original thinker. And a lot of our, you know, former Bruins are, are in the media. Sean Farnham with ESPN, John Crispin with ESPN. Uh, Baron Davis has done some really interesting yeah. things too in terms of filmmaking in the entrepreneurial world. Josiah Johnson. Uh, with Comedy Central, him and Quinn Hawking came up with the concept of the Legends of Chamberlain Heights, which was loosely based off their experience at UCLA as bench warmers, uh, but leveraging and taking full advantage, almost like the entourage of basketball in terms of hanging out uh, in Westwood. Now they made it about a high school because something to do with the rights in terms of UCLA. But uh, so really some creative people that I was able to work with and uh, run with and, and really grateful because of that experience. So, Coach, we mentioned off of the top about the New York City versus L.A. experience and lifestyle. Um, but now in terms of basketball, um, of course, a lot of these big time programs in the country, they're in what we call college towns, right? Smaller area, uh, just the fans live and die by every single game. New York City and L.A., they're not really like that because you have a lot going on outside of that. You have the pro sports teams. Um, you have entertainment shows, yeah. uh, things like that. So what are the pros and cons of being in a big market for college basketball specifically? Yeah. I mean, the positives are, you know, New York and LA being entertainment centers, of the world really media meccas uh, help us recruit because uh, life after basketball, the opportunities that exist in New York and LA uh, obviously are plentiful. And so uh, I enjoyed being in those big markets, but my coaching start 32 years ago, I guess 33 years ago now was at Purdue West Lafayette. Uh, Gene Cady gave me the opportunity of a lifetime uh, when he hired me onto his staff and everything that's happened since is really a result of, of coach Cade giving me that big break that we all need uh, regardless of our profession or, or business that we're in. So I enjoyed my time in the big 10 and being in a smaller town, with rabid Boilermaker fans, uh, great tradition and heritage at Purdue. That's actually where John Wooden was a three-time All-American, uh, 1928 to 1932, uh, obviously many years before he ended up coming out West to become the UCLA coach. Um, but the big markets, you know, when we get it rolling uh, at a school like UCLA or at St. John's and you're playing before packed houses, uh, those palpable buzz, uh, the, that, that just energy, that's uh, – it's uh, in play. Uh, that was a little Freudian slip there, I guess. Uh, <laughs> palpable buzz. But you get the idea that it's just uh, unique. And so I think it helped our you know, student athletes prepare for life in the next level, whether that's in professional sports or in the working world, because uh, there's a microscope on you and you're scrutinized. As I used to say, like a frog in a biology class, uh, you're analyzed, criticized. Uh, dissected, probed, poked. And so that's good preparation for uh, life in the big city, so to speak, and uh, and life beyond sport. But uh, for the number of players that went into the NBA, I think they were better prepared. Their preparedness for uh, being critiqued and, um, and, and you know, having to speak in front of uh, hundreds of cameras and uh, just dealing with the uh, expectations. And so part of being a professional is, is learning how to conduct yourself and uh, deal with the media and the scrutiny and the electronic age that we live in, uh, the 24 hour sports news cycles, uh, podcasts and shows like the one we're doing right now. And I think uh, the players that came up, um, you know, and matured through their experiences, St. John's and UCLA uh, was a real plus, a real positive for their training. Uh, for life beyond college athletics. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the New York media can be brutally honest. Rico here, he, what, you calling the WFAN here and oh, there? Oh, yeah, big time. <laughs> WFAN calling back in the day. Uh -huh. Rico also blocks anyone that says mean things to him on Twitter, so no. he's the softest person here. <laughs> I've actually, yeah. Good news, coach. Never said a bad word about this. So, uh, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> you know what comes with the territory. You, you have to kind of keep a lighthearted outlook on all of it yeah, and oh, yeah. be grateful. 
to even be in the mix for people to take shots at of you course. because it means, you know, you've arrived, uh, you know, to a certain degree when you're in New York or L.A. and, and they're writing about you or talking about you on talk radio. And my experiences in New York and L.A. is really what set up the uh, runs in broadcasting at ABC and ESPN and now with Fox Sports. And now I'm on the other side of it. And there's something that's uh, kind of ironic about that. Uh, but I think, you know, one experience informs the other. My time as a coach informed my perspective as a broadcaster. And yet my time in broadcasting, barnstorming around the country and watching different teams and coaches uh, prepare and play and, and practice in between the games, uh, that increases your acumen. And uh, you're always learning. We're always growing. We're a work in progress. And so then when returning to coaching, you're bringing that increased acumen and sharper perspective uh, back to your coaching experiences. So sure. um, I never got too caught up. You just got to have, uh, you know, the thickness of skin, uh, like like an elephant's fanny, uh, which is pretty thick. <laughs> so, it's actually, yeah. Don't worry. If you go, when you get back to coaching, I'll start tweeting at you that you dog shit, just to make sure you feel I, it's me. <laughs> I look, I look forward to it. I might even, I might even, I might even volley a couple back over the net uh, electro electronically. <laughs> so Jake touched on the big markets, uh, and obviously you touched on Fox. A lot of what you guys cover are those those Big East games. I grew up; it's right around the corner at the Garden. That was like the best having those tickets. Uh, Nova, obviously, unfortunately, down with Gillespie. Creighton's dealing with some stuff off the court. We've been saying it. The Big East is kind of wide open. Who are you looking at as far as somebody who can can win that league? Because it does seem like it's wide open right now. Yeah, you know the teams at the top um, going through some difficult times. You mentioned. Uh, Colin Gillespie with that heartbreaking and season ending injury, but they're still legitimate. Um, Justin Moore and Caleb Daniels, the transfer from Tulane, those two are as good as it gets as a backcourt, uh, even in the absence of, of Colin Gillespie. And Jeremiah Robinson Earl uh, is outstanding, maybe the most intelligent frontline player in the country, very cerebral and uh, anchors their defense at the rim and has versatility on offense. Uh, Jermaine Samuels playing the best basketball of his career and Jay Wright, a hall of fame coach, uh, you know, not in there yet, but will be shortly with two national titles, three final fours and Villanova imposes their preferred tempo as well as any team in the country. Uh, they play at a very deliberate pace, uh, but that patience offensively is part of their defense. Cause when they have the ball and they don't turn it over only nine miscues per game, and that's second in all of NCAA basketball, uh, that's possessions and seconds that their opponents don't have the ball. And that means their opponents can't score on them. So they play a little bit of defense with their patient offense. I think Creighton going through it uh, because of Coach McDermott's comments and uh, they're a basketball family. Uh, they're clearly at a place, uh, a juncture, an intersection. It's very difficult and, uh, you know, sensitive, uh, fragile um, in terms of, you know, team building and, and being a basketball family and dealing with those dynamics. But at the end of the day, Coach Mack uh, has had a great track record of success at Creighton, and he has great personnel. Um, Marcus Zagorowski leads them. He's the preseason Big East Player of the Year. And uh, Mitch Ballack lights it up from all angles. And so Creighton will still be a factor. It's just really whether or not this experience, the events of the last week, uh, throw them for a loop. You know, do they galvanize and come together and become closer like a family because of coach max comments or is it a scenario where it divides them some and uh, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out yukon is hitting on all cylinders james book Knight comes back all the other pieces around book Knight, uh when you look at uh, rj cole playing the best basketball of his career and uh whaley has been outstanding uh you know active on the board sonogo as well has been a presence along the baseline uh, tyrese martin is legitimate, um, a tough matchup for opponents and coming off a goose egg performance earlier this week, but expect him to be a factor. So those three right now are at the top. And I think Seton Hall uh, still has a run in them. Mm -hmm. um, they've, they've challenged themselves. They've played a number of tough games, I think nine quad one games. Uh, they're three and six in those nine games. Uh, but they have the personnel, the front line, uh, Mamu's versatility, and uh, Jared Roden, I think a next level prospect. We're going to see him play in the NBA for a long time. Um, and he's a tough guard as well. So those are the top four teams. And, and don't forget about St. John's because they get to play 
the Big East tournament on their home court in Madison Square Garden. Yep. Mike Anderson's done an outstanding job, got them headed in the right way. Posh Alexander, a tenacious defender and, and, and arguably the freshman of the year in the Big East. 100%. And we talked about it earlier on, um, how you have plenty of history coaching. Is that door still open? Are you trying to get back into the coaching mix uh, here in college basketball, or do you enjoy the broadcasting side of things? Where are we at with that? Yeah, I love broadcasting. Uh, number one, you're undefeated, which is always a <laughs> good thing to be. You don't you don't lose a game in broadcasting. And it does provide a little more, uh, you know, work-life balance, I think, is, is the, uh, you know, the term that's used uh, frequently today, uh, but I do miss coaching. I miss the competition. I miss the camaraderie with the young people. I miss being on a college campus and uh, yet yeah, competing at the highest level, making runs to the NCAA tournament or even runs in the NCAA tournament, which is sweeter. And uh, just the relationship with young people. I, I enjoy the recruiting part process. Um, you know, we start recruiting kids when they're 15, 16 years old and they, come play for you when they're 18 or 19. They leave you when they're 22 or 23, but uh, you have relationships with them um, for life. And so if the right fit presented, um, you know, and I was intrigued and thought we could win and it was a mutual embrace, uh, I'd make a return to coaching. And that's why I came out of television and went to St. John's. Big East, New York City, Madison Square Garden, great tradition. I knew we could recruit at a high level and start getting guys to go to the league like Jakar Sampson and uh, Reese Harkless, and, and obviously we had some outstanding players that are killing it overseas, like uh, D'Angelo Harris and Phil Green and Don Pointers uh, with the Cavaliers right now in the G League. Uh, but we were fortunate uh, to take a team that we inherited to the tournament, and then we started from scratch, had no players returning in year two, and uh, really a rebuild, like an expansion team effort, and took that group to the NCAA tournament their senior year, got to see them cross the finish line, all of them got their college degrees and except for the players, obviously that went on to the NBA, like Jakar and Harkless, Amir Garrett, from major league baseball, the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, but the kids that stayed in school and used their eligibility all got their degrees. And that's so important for life after basketball. Uh, if you don't make the zillions of dollars that the lottery picks make that go out early. Aligning with us would be a good idea. So mm -hmm. Marty is addicted to now breaking news. <laughs> yeah. He tried to do the uh, Io DeSumo news that last week. He's one of two, so 500. And up it. I can do I love it. I'm a lunatic on Twitter. We also have the A-10s going on right now. We have a guy, Spider, here who <laughs> relentlessly, relentlessly went after Fordham's coach. You like New York City. If you want to make the move, just tell us. We'll start that Lavin to Fordham move right now. Marty will break the news. I, Spider would, would hammer the coach, and I'll do whatever you want. It, it sounds like a law firm. Marty and Spider. <laughs> and, I love it. And, and Jake. And uh, obviously anyone with the nickname Spider yeah. is, uh, you know, is someone to take seriously. And it could be that, you know, maybe you represent me on the agent side get some kickbacks and we'll work out, you know, what the, com the commission is on, on something like I that. Work, uh, I but, just work for gear, coach. Yeah, I don't need to get paid here. <laughs> I leave, I just take t-shirts. That's it. So I, I'll be I love it. it. Yeah. So. I'll, 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 I'll send you some good uh, Japanese uh, whiskey. Uh, maybe, uh, <laughs> the, yeah. The blue maybe, sky, uh, uh, the whiskey. I mean, uh, yeah. That was unbelievable. Is, uh, <laughs> we're going to bat for you every this turn is, and you just keep rubbing it on the face. Yeah. Like, All right, we yeah, get it. You're yeah. in California, coach. I enjoy it. Yeah. But I but but I rehydrate with the Gatorade <laughs> All right. know, just to just to just to balance it out. This is actually uh Hibiki, uh Japanese whiskey harmony, I think is the name of it, which is a, a great way to go, right? To be in harmony. Uh you three are working in harmony and uh, well, today is all about harmony as I Whenever yeah. someone's like talks like highly or like knows so much about a whiskey, I think you're the smartest person in the world. Like, I, 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 yeah, like you took, just, you're like you're talking about it, this Japanese it was, it whiskey was, and harmony. I'm like that man should be running yeah. for president. <laughs> <laughs> it was an acquired taste, and interestingly, I picked it up when I was in New York those five years, 2010 to 15, with the uh, you know nor'easters and and some of the let's put, you know, difficult weather conditions. Yes. Then I became a big fan coming home, uh, fighting through those conditions. And there was nothing like a good scotch or a good whiskey, a good bourbon, uh, just to, you know, for the vital signs to warm you up and, uh, Love and to that. make it through those winters. So it was, I was like 45 years old before I picked up. So there's time right. to acquire <laughs> that taste.
All right, I got some. One hundred percent. So Rico brought up the Fordham opening. If you if you want to tell us, give us the green light. Steve Lavin is, is interested in blank <laughs> job. I know uh, Penn State, Boston College. We're your guys to hype you up and get you on the uh, radar here. So just let us know. I will. And you know, the real key is the fit. And um, you know, naturally, Fordham's in New York and in the Atlantic Ten, and and uh, great tradition and heritage from an academic standpoint, going way back. Uh, Vince Lombardi. And uh, it's been a while in terms of basketball. I think Digger Phelps had the great run back in the day. Uh, he had a short stay as the head coach of Ford and then went on to Notre Dame. But uh, he had an outstanding team and season. And uh, Nick McCarchick, uh, maybe early 90s, late 80s also, I think, had some success. And then it's been a while. But, um, you know, I never campaign publicly for a position. It's like the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a lot of respect. Uh, Eddie Cole. Uh, worked at St. John's. He's now the athletic director at uh, Fordham. And I know he's going to do an outstanding job and they're going to do a national search and uh, come up with the right fit. And that's really what it's about. You know, I wouldn't have returned to coaching if a great fit didn't present. St. John's was a place that I knew we could be successful. And, and we were two NCAAs, two NITs, you know, average 20 wins a season. Uh, the one year we didn't have success, I was out with cancer. I missed a season. Um, but survive that, which was a more important victory uh, than coaching games or any outcome of a game because uh, cancer is real. And that's a life changing kind of experience on a number of levels. But uh, that's a talk for another day. Um, but if a good fit presented, um, it's really about that. It's not like what part of the country or what conference it's it's more. Is there that mutual embrace and are all the elements in play to be able to win and win big? And it takes time. You're not going to do it overnight. We are fortunate at St. John's in year one uh, to climb the standings. I think we finished, you know, tied for third. And that was the old Big East. 11 teams yep. went to the NCAA tournament that year, a record setting 11 teams. <clears throat> and I think uh, Villanova was, no, Creighton. No, not Creighton. That was Connecticut was nine and nine that year. That was the cardiac Kemba league year. Yep. That's right. They are 500. They were undefeated in the non-conference. They, they won the Maui Invitational. They were nine and nine in conference where everyone knows each other, razor thin margin for air. They know how to play against one another in that chess match of college hoops. And then they went undefeated in the Big East tournament and the NCAA tournament. Kind of remarkable and anomaly. It'll probably never happen again. Just even the mathematical probabilities are so unlikely. Uh, but Kemba was outstanding. Of course, Jim Calhoun, a Hall of Fame coach as well. So uh, some special memories from the Big East. And I do miss that camaraderie with, you know, with the conference coaches. And, uh, you know, where there's a, a real affinity and respect for one another. And yet when you're playing against each other, uh, you're, you're trying to take each other out. And uh, that's a that's kind of a special thing, a bonding experience that happens. So I miss uh, my brethren in the in the Big East. And uh, if a good fit presented, I consider it. But I also love my work at Fox and, and I love the detached little wider angle lens or prism when you're broadcasting, which is even a better experience or perspective for learning and growing because you're not so close to it as you are when coaching. Speaking of broadcasting too, I'm a, I'm a big gambler and I know you uh, have comment you've done with little things with uh, Musburger and we talked to Ooh. Fran for this year, this year on podcast and he had a couple stories about Musburger and I love him because at the end of the games, it's like, Oh, the over that something will hit over. Like he'll, he always That's does a subtle, yeah, eight. he does a yeah. subtle little, um, yeah. Jabs, do you have any stories about him? Yeah, number one, he was a mentor. You know, I was fortunate to work under Gene Cady and who broke me into this business. And in broadcasting, it was Brent Musburger. I had some bosses as well, Dan Steer and Dave Miller, executives at ESPN. And there were people that hired me, like you know, Mark Shapiro and uh John Wildhack, who's now the athletic director yep. at Syracuse, but prior was at ESPN. And so there are a number of mentors, but uh, Brent really, in terms of, you know, being in front of the camera, in terms of understanding the fundamentals, the mechanics of sports television, uh, he was as good as it gets. It, it'd be the equivalent of a young film director getting to work with uh, Fellini or Truffaut or Cocteau or Lucas or Spielberg. And Brent, with all that bandwidth of knowledge and wisdom, uh, took me under his wing and really kind of molded me, uh, helped shape uh, my broadcasting future. And he did have a knack, a gift for dropping in 
uh, those gambling references. It, it might be, uh, you know, Badgers, you know, Spartans, uh, you know, timeout sitting on an 11. We'll be right back, <laughs> folks. you know, or that basket, you know, may be more important than the casual observer realizes, or, you know, <laughs> that free throw, you know, so, uh, but he did it subtly and, and never in a way that got us in trouble or hot water. And of course, he's such a big personality in the history of television and sports television specifically, and uh, had great stories. You know, he used to hang out with the Marx Brothers back in the day when he was a news reporter on TV here in Los Angeles and uh, went to one of Groucho Marx's birthday parties. So uh, he's seen everything. And what I love is he brings the same degree of enthusiasm and professionalism and uh, really, you know, broadcasting for him is, is a craft. It's a vocation. Uh, it's an art form. And uh, the enthusiasm for calling, you know, a game of the week in basketball or football or when he was working in studio with the NFL or even called Major League Baseball, um, that same enthusiasm is there for the Little League World Series. And that's why I have so much respect for him and uh, kind of the dignity that he brings to sports television. And I used to kid him and say that he, that, that, you know, he had money on a bocce ball tournament in Tuscany. And uh, he knew he knew the odds on uh, every sporting event in the world, you know, this traveling sports book. And, and he's found a great home with his business that he's launched out of Vegas and a perfect fit and also calling Raider games. So uh, he truly is a, a national treasure. And uh, in the history of sports television, as good as it gets. I sure. love them. Just Don't you the, bet like Mexican baseball? I bet Mexican baseball. <laughs> I'm all over the place. I think me and Brent will get a g very long for sure. <laughs> no doubt. Jake touched on the return to coaching. The interesting thing is you haven't been gone for a long time. It's been five years. Uh, and I remember reading an article when Mike D'Antoni did that seven seconds or less offense that was revolutionary. It was not too long ago. Right now it would be like 24th in pace. Like, the game has, has gone so much faster. Having watched all these college games and been a coach forever, what's the biggest change to the game you've seen in the last five years? Also, Rico's obsessed with pace. He just loves the pace of play. Tempo, pace, <laughs> obsessed. So, Yeah, the, uh, the analytics and the metrics, that's one of the aspects that in all of sports is a big consideration, right? It used to be, you know, Billy Bean, that was really unique in terms of what he was doing with the A's and, young executives, uh, you know, coming out of Ivy League schools. Um, but now that's prevalent. And, you know, if I look at college basketball, you know, one of the big changes was the clock. Uh, probably somewhere in the early 80s. They experimented with it, but, you know, eventually it was 45 seconds, and I think it went to 35 seconds, right, 30 seconds, the clock, shorter possessions, uh, in the hope that that would create higher scoring games and be more entertaining from a viewer standpoint and putting, you know, fans in the seats. Uh, then the three point shot changed the game, right? First Europe international basketball had that three point line before we did. That was 1987. Uh, ironically, Bobby Knight's Indiana Hoosiers, you know, win the national championship behind Steve Alford and Keith Smart, and Dean Garrett and that group. And uh, they knock off Syracuse in the final on that baseline jumper by Keith Smart. And the interesting thing there was Bob Knight was not a proponent of the three-point line, but once they, once they put the rule in, uh, he took advantage of it. And that's what great coaches do is they understand how to exploit, whether it's the clock or the three-point line. And I think now the biggest change has been the transfer portal. Uh, dramatic, uh, in particular graduate transfers, because you can reload, completely alter your roster by acquiring high-level players from across the country uh, that have graduated and come right into your program, the equivalent of free agency. And we've seen certain programs take advantage of that. I think over 700 players were in the transfer portal uh, last off season. That number will probably continue to grow. And so that's been the biggest change. You know, you have to have assistant coaches that are focused solely, uh, almost like in the NBA where there's, you know, someone that's, you know, in a front office that's focused on the cap and the cap space and all those uh, aspects in terms of the financials of an NBA team. And now in college, uh, you need someone full time looking for those potential graduate transfers. And um, and it's in some ways unfortunate because you have these mid-major programs um, and their best players are being poached. 
And it puts those coaches in a tough predicament where they don't have the ability to turn around that quickly and be able to reload uh, the way the higher level programs, uh, the blue bloods are able to. So, but there is a balancing act there because the blue bloods also lose players early in the NBA and mid majors are less likely to lose players early to the NBA. And so mid major programs tend to have more continuity, um, you know, kind of the tortoise and the hare game, that fable. Um, and you need those players to provide you stability and continuity. And so you just have to keep adjusting and adapting um, just like we do in every aspect. The coronavirus, right, has clearly informed that perspective and approach uh, as a country and as individuals uh, from state to state, right? Uh, the protocols are different, but it's upon us individually and then collectively as a country to do the best we can to minimize and try and flatten that curve. And, and uh, the vaccines obviously are uh, going to play a big part in that. Uh, but there's also the fundamentals of the washing the hands and the, and, uh, the masks and uh, all the other things in terms of being prudent and whatnot. But that's an example of how you have to evolve, change, adapt, modify, just like a basketball team does and just like coaches have to. And I enjoy that part of the sport in terms of trying to teach those virtues and values that transcend sport and help prepare you for the game of life, uh, help set you up for life, building those tools. And I, I equate them to like a good flashlight in a toolbox or a good compass, a paintbrush, a tape measure, all the things you need. And we all uh, have to continue to build our toolbox as the world changes. 100%. We'll get you out of here on this, Coach. All right. March Madness coming up. One team to win it all. Who's cutting down the nets when this tournament's all said and done? Hmm. I would lean to the obvious. That's not an interesting pick. But it seems as though, you know, this could be uh, Gonzaga's year. If I was going to go dark horse, I'd say Purdue. Ooh, I think ooh, Purdue's I like quickness. That. Death tax. Yeah. Man. Yeah, Travion Williams, uh, outstanding, you know, post player that can step away, enjoys the thrill of the pass. When he brings the opposing team's big man out on the floor, Purdue runs great sets. It sets up their back cuts. It sets up uh, the dribble penetration game. Uh, they're playing three or four freshmen that continue to improve. And that upside is what's intriguing. We see that sometimes, you know, Arizona 97 when they won it. Uh, Mike Bibby and uh, Jason Terry, Miles, Miles Simon. Simon. Yeah, those guys were improving, especially the younger players, the underclassmen. And so you look for teams where the ceiling is, is unknown. In other words, they can get better through the conference tournament and through each week of the tournament. And the teams that are growing, you know, during February and March are the ones that are most dangerous. And so sometimes you got to look at power conference teams I call them bloodied but unbowed. In other words, they've been beat up. They've, they've been cannibalized and cannibalizing one another in a power conference. Like the Big 12, who I think has the most teams capable of cutting down the nets, the most teams capable of, of getting to the deeper rounds of the NCAA tournament. I think the Big 10 has the most bids of any conference. They may get nine or 10, but that's different than having five or six that can make it to the Elite Eight, you know, and then punch through to a Final Four and win a national title. So, Big 12, uh, watch those teams do the handicapping on those those squads. Oh, yeah. uh, they're fast, they're quick, they're athletic. The Big 12 is really the equivalent of what the Southeastern Conference is, right, in, in football. The Big 12 is that in basketball. Speed and skill, length, guys can get up down the floor. And also, back to handicapping, they have six coaches who have been to Final Fours or won a national title. Right? So more than half the conference, there's 10 teams in the Big 12, 60% uh, have the jockeys, the coaches who have gotten to the winner circle. And if you add Scott Drew, because he'll probably get there this year, by next year it's going to be 70% That's of the insane. league. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, and, and for instance, the Big Ten has one. Tom Izzo, only jockey to get to the winner circle. The Pac-12 has one. Dana Altman, only jockey to get to the winner circle. And uh, the Southeastern Conference and the Big 12 each have six coaches that have been to the winner circle. So that plays – a factor as well because familiarity with tournament conditions and coaches who've been there before understanding how to peak their team and they're not there for the first time like a tourist just taking pictures happy to have arrived they're instead going back to either win the title or get another title uh, if they already have one 
That's what I keep saying with this. I mean, Dickinson's unbelievable at Michigan. Livers, they're, they're loaded. But I keep saying Jawan Howard has zero tournament wins. Is that something you worry about a little bit with Michigan as far as the team? Who- well, here, yeah, it, it's it's not so much a worry, but it is an element or a factor. Now, you know, there are coaches who defied the odds. Steve Fisher had never been a head coach in the NCAA tournament when he took over for Bill Frieder. And Glenn Rice, Ramil Robinson and company won the national title. So, you know, it's been done. Uh, Shaka Smart, right, made that great run with BCU. He's now in the Big 12 at Texas. But there's no doubt, I can even speak for myself, the first time in the NCAA tournament as a 32-year-old head coach at UCLA in my rookie season was a scenario where everything was faster. That, that first time, and it's probably the equivalent of the first race you run, you know, uh, if you're a NASCAR race driver or if you're an astronaut, the first mission into space, right, going to the moon. Uh, your vital signs are going to be north, and you're experiencing everything in a faster way. Now, now by my eighth NCAA tournament uh, at St. John's, six at UCLA, two at St. John's, I'm seeing things at a slower pace. Doesn't guarantee we're going to win, but no doubt your decision-making – is going to be sharper in terms of substitutions, when to call a timeout, when not to call a timeout, what adjustments. And, uh, you know, at 32, 33, 34, 35, I left UCLA at 38. You know, by 37 years old, you're, you have a better feel uh, when you step into the tournament and how to best lead your team. Again, doesn't guarantee success. So much as matchups, a bounce of the ball, an official's call, uh, so many, an injury. You know, uh, we dealt with, you know, three or four, consecutive years of losing one of our best players, Baron Davis in my second year. I think it was Dan Gutzarek uh, in my third year. And um, Johnny McCoy was in my first year. And those are, you know, NBA players and you're losing them, you know, coming into the tournament or in the middle of the NCAA tournament. So, so often staying injury free is the most important element in 95. When coach Eric led our team to the national championship, we didn't have an injury all season until Tyus Edney, was hurt in the semifinals against Oklahoma State. We tried tried him early in the game against Arkansas. You could see clearly his hand was hurting him to the point where he wasn't going to be able to play. And Cameron Dollar stepped in, who had started previously earlier in the season, and he led us, um, you know, down the stretch. It was really Ed O'Bannon and Charles O'Bannon and, you know, Toby Bailey and J.R. Henderson and company. The numbers they put up were remarkable. But Cameron Dollar was the one that set the table, with spoon-feeding those guys and uh, distributing the ball and orchestrating our offense in, in Tyus's absence. My point, though, it wasn't until the semifinals that we had a single injury that year. And when you have a magical season, often that's often that's the case, uh, something we have to just be fortunate. 100%. You guys got anything else? No, that's good. Yeah. No. So that's uh, Coach Steve Lavin. You can catch him on Fox Sports throughout championship week, best time of year. Uh, I'm going to keep referring to you as Coach because – if and when you get back there, we're already on your bandwagon now, wherever you go. So and we you appreciate have any, the uh, downtime during a broadcast. Just be like, ah, oh, the Bench Mob podcast. Fantastic people. <laughs> that, that's just yeah. my, not my words. No doubt. And that would be authentic and from the heart because I feel that way sincerely. And also, though, in exchange, everything's a barter system. You know, you guys are East Coasters. Uh, maybe a little gear because then I can also oh. represent by, by wearing some gear. So, already you know, I'll send you some gear. You guys send some gear and. And should I give the should I give a shot of yeah? Of the <laughs> give the shot. Of have to. Give we started shot with it. We got to end with it. Show Steve Lavin so in Los Angeles. Mm. Unbelievable. <laughs> Must fucking, be nice. Fucking pools and shit. <laughs> <laughs> wow, nice incredible. Green trees. Look at that. Amazing. Well, coach. I love I love you guys. Love you <laughs> too. Appreciate coach. it. Thank you. All right.